everyone and welcome to a new episode of last best hope for conversation your podcast all about babylon 5 and i am jesse jackson and joining me here in the cnc is karen hello and lou how do folks and go into the chapter and we're <laughs> gonna well. get married maybe we are talking Sick Transit Veer, the 12th episode of season three, uh, originally aired April 15th, 1996, written as all of these episodes have been by J. Michael Stravinsky. I think this is a fun one, even though there is a lot of disturbing discussion of certain topics. Lou, your thoughts? I can see within the arc of a season why you want to do a change-up episode after the the heavy ones that we've come through. So I enjoyed the concept of the episode, but I didn't the the actual execution of it would left me a little okay, mm-hmm. okay. It was an episode, but let's get back okay. to the real. Let's get back to the real stuff. <laughs> Interesting. It was an episode. All yeah. right, Karen. How about you? Yeah, same. The disturbing part, of course, was the bugs. It's, it has nothing to do with anything. I'm being sarcastic, obviously. Yeah, like Lou says, it was an episode, period. I say that it is your birthday, like from the office. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was okay. And I get where there are some things that go in the main story arc, so that's good. But otherwise, just a, uh, huh. okay. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I do think this was a change-up pitch, right, mm-hmm. to talk about. Mm-hmm what's going on. And I had stressed that I don't think there's a bad episode rest of the season, except for one I don't care for. But, and I do think this episode, I think if you're rewatching the series, you know that, oh, we're taking a step back and taking a breath and you can enjoy it more Mm -hmm. from that perspective. But yeah. So I think let's go, let's just go to dessert first. John wants to see Delenn in a different light. And she was, so I think that Mary and Farron played that perfectly because you don't know if she's being literal or she knows what he's doing and she's just and she's teasing, teasing him. him. Mm-hmm. But I loved everything about him asking her out and him over worrying about dinner. And we almost got a kiss. Mm. Almost got a kiss. So Karen, as our rom-com expert, (laughs) tell me what you're thinking about this latest chapter of our love story. So cute. I love that he wants, he's working so hard to get her this, I would say charcuterie board, but it's a charcuterie quarters. It's his entire quarters is just full and it it's so cute to see him be nervous with her. He was even nervous asking her out. I think mm-hmm. that's why he was beating around the bush. Yes. And I think she just doesn't know our idioms. But once she realized he was trying to ask her out, I think she teased him a little bit. Just a, a really cute storyline. My husband and I watched it this morning, actually, while I was getting ready to come in here and we just had it on in the background and he was watching the part where she puts salt and pepper on the flarn and he said yeah I remember when you made me scampy when we were first dating and I didn't like it and I said what you didn't like my skin (laughs) and that's 27 years ago it does happen in real life which I found out And I just, I really thought their relationship is getting very cute. Not at all steamy in this episode, obviously. Mostly just, I would say meet cute, but it's not a meet cute. They already know each other, but it's the beginning of their awakening towards each other, which I think is cool. And you're right, Mira Ferlin is fantastic. 
and when she plays this romantic lead kind of part it's nice yeah. to see her in that kind of a light-hearted role yeah and i just i agree with you it is you wonder how much is that aren't you seeing me now am i now translucent mm -hmm. just so silly i think maybe that was 50 50 she at first she didn't understand what he was saying and then all of a sudden ah, i see what he's saying now i'm gonna play it up yeah yeah, absolutely. Lou? Yeah, I enjoyed their scenes together. I think with them and all the actors in the scenes, I have no issues with the acting. I thought everybody did a fantastic job. And in particular, Bruce Boxleitner and Amira Furlan both played their parts very well. They were both like fumbling teenagers in mm -hmm. a way. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. And I actually thought Bruce Boxleitner played his scenes very well too. He but he was very nervous and and then at the end when he when she accepted his invitation he, and she walked away the smile on his face was it was all very really nice and I enjoyed it for what it was. Yeah, one of the things that I one of my favorite scenes is ordinary people when uh Timothy um, Hutton, yeah, is asking Elizabeth McGovern out, and he's so nervous on the phone. And then when she they stumble, and then she says yes, and he just has this look of, and it reminded me of that feeling when you're asking someone out, and you aren't sure they're going to say yes, and when they do, that just that joy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just really, I love that. And he's, I, I think it's also sweet that he wanted to cook for her, not order something in. And and I just knew when she was tasting it, I'm like, okay, I wonder how bad it tastes. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it wasn't that bad as just it 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 needed salt and just, pepper. Yeah, it, it, was, it, was it was bland. bland. Under season. Yeah, yeah. It was bland. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Our, and right when he rushed out of the date because he heard Veer was being attacked, and then also it does look like later they were going to kiss, but Susan has horrible timing. And I will tell you that in real time according to Lurker's Guide, that people were very frustrated and wanted that kiss. And he said, I'm teasing and I have something special planned. So just throw that out there as a clue. When you mean he, you mean JMS? JMS has something yeah, okay. planned on a, on a first kiss because people are now really, <clears throat> they're into this relationship. They mm. really are looking for him to do things. Good. So as a side note, Susan is having so much trouble around romance in this episode. Yes. Not just with interrupting their kiss, but that whole yeah. conversation with Veer. Was yes, so I, I'm looking forward to visiting about that. Susan is having bad dreams. She is dreaming that she is naked. I am someone who has that dream fairly often. Usually I am not totally naked. It's, I've forgotten my pants for somehow. <laughs> right. Like, I'm in underwear. You're Donald Duck in it? Yes. And and I always am, like, in my mind, I know it's a dream, but it also it's very disheartening. It's and, jarring, and, right? Yeah, it is very yeah. jarring, yeah. Uh, I have so, the one where I'm in high school, and I've forgotten my classes, and I've forgotten the number to my locker. Yeah. That's the one I have all the time. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what about you, Lou? Do you yeah. have a recurring uh, nightmare? Uh, not really. I I don't remember my dreams very often. Uh, the probably the, the ones I remember the most are sometimes I have a like I'm falling. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are bad. Those are the ones that stick with me because I'm af afraid of heights. But yeah, I've never had the I'm naked dream that no, I can recall. Either. And yeah, it's usually that I some it's a, just a general feeling of I'm lost and I can't find my way back out to where I'm supposed to go. Dream. That's really yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. So I'm the a deep big... sleeper. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. That is good. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> as we uh, found out this morning. Yes. <laughs> Someone uh, slept through his alarm. Just a side. Yeah. Yep. Which is rare. 
Yeah, it is. It is. You've never done that with us. Because you're always an early riser. Yeah. yeah. Generally, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's talk the big storyline. Veer is coming back. We actually get to see him on uh, on Centauri. They're telling him how much the Emperor is impressed with his reports, even though he's listening too much to to Londo. They're feeling pretty good. And he shows up and turns out that his uncle, and I assume his parents have nothing to do with this because his uncle is like the patriarch of the family, and has re- worked with another family, and Veer is to be married. And so we have this whole storyline, and she is very beautiful, but has just a flaw or two. Carmen Thomas is the actress who plays Lindsay. I guess Lindsay. Lindsay. Yeah. Lou, let's start with you, and we'll just go all through the storyline, and let's just visit. Okay, so starting out with Veer on Centuri, that was interesting in that he's uh, ogling or touching the throne and just like kicking the tires. And I I thought that was interesting. But that aid that came in, that Minister Verini, 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 I don't know how you ever say it. Yeah, Milo Verini. I don't know why the actor played the characters that way. He was very off, I thought. For somebody that high up, he seems... (laughs) <laughs> eccentric it would be a word and a half i guess you could say but yeah and then that at, at the time in that episode that joke about the narn like how many narn does it what's more dangerous than a, a room filled with narns one angry narn with a key i was going okay that's i guess that's trying to highlight how xenophobic the centuri are about the narn because it was like a, a pretty lame joke and I thought, what the hell? Where's this going? And yeah, we find out later on in the episode what's going on with that. So, the, and we'll get into that discussion maybe a bit later. But that the whole storyline with Veer and the and the Narn and his actions, as opposed to how Centauri viewed the Narn in general, and especially his bride to be, is specifically as a microcosm of that. I just found the behavior of the majority like Londo and his bride to be in that towards what Veer had done to be weird because if it would seem to me that in a normal or in a real world situation if you did something like that you would be like it would be like running the underground railroad. Like you, if you got yes. caught, you would be, you wouldn't just be like slapped on the wrist. You'd be taken away and put in jail. I and mean, I just, I was just grappling with that whole idea of with, and and that's why I had trouble enjoying the rest of the episode once that came out because it was like they they're not reacting properly to this unless I'm misreading that whole dynamic within the within the framework of the show. And how they've established how the Centauri feel towards the, Nar- the Narn. It was just a weird, oh, you bad little boy. We're going to have to set you straight instead of we're going to lock you up and throw you in jail. And like, I just didn't, I just, maybe I mis- I misunderstood that. Or I just thought it was a, a gaping plot hole that they just chose to ignore because viewers are a semi-regular character and they want to mm-hmm. keep them on the show. So I... And I don't know where that's going to go forward, that whole thing. It was just a big plot point that I struggled with through the rest of the episode. Okay. What do you think, Karen, before I discuss? Yeah, I got the idea. And Londo actually says, I haven't told them exactly what happened when Veer questions him right. about it. And my thought is that Londo is struggling to redeem himself and that maybe he thinks it's okay that that Veer did this and so he doesn't want to reveal that he's committed treason he just says that his and I'm assuming I'm again I'm reading into this but he does say I didn't give them all the details of what you've done 
I'm assuming he says he's crazy talking. He's he's yeah. saying that that the Narn aren't that bad, and so we got to adjust him a little bit. I think he he made sure not to report that Veer had done something like treason or worthy of death or being locked up or whatever, and that he is much more sympathetic than he puts on. That's just my thought, and I'm hoping that's the case, that he's covering for Veer, it, saying that I regret the actions I've taken and I didn't want them wiped off the universe. I can't really go out of my way to, to do anything myself. I did think it was humorous that Veer used, what is it, Abrahamo Lincolni? Yes. As the name of the, because it is something that the Centauri probably wouldn't pick up on. Uh, it being a, a major, like, American human yeah. kind of figure. And apt, because freeing the slaves and all that. And what Lou says, that's 100% true. If he was caught, that it would probably be death, I'm assuming, for him. Because... I think it's treasonous, and we all know that they think the Narn are the lowest of the low, and so if someone helps them, they are not Centauri. They're not worthy of being Centauri. So yeah, I think that he was saved that fate by Londo, and that Londo is recalling him, I'm not sure what that goal is. Um, I would think that Londo would still want him to be on Mimbar, but like Lou said, he's probably ready to come back to the show. And so that's why they did that. But very cool. I thought, I, like Lou said, the joke was stupid, but it does show that he is, his attitude towards the Narn is that kind of, they're nothing. They're bugs under my shoe, which I mean, I'm assuming that's where the whole bug storyline comes in, that Londo is killing mm -hmm. those bugs and maybe that's how the Centauri feel about Narn. But yeah, I, uh, that whole storyline I thought was very good. I like that we see that side of Veer and that he's actually doing something active. Yeah. Instead of just voicing his opinion, he's actually taking action. And I just, I really like Veer very much in this episode. Yeah, I, I think, and this is just my version, Lou, is that because Londo cares for him, and you can argue whether he should or not, but I think we've established that Londo finds him very endearing. And so he is similar to someone covering up if their child something like a DWI, which is absolutely horrible, but because they're your child, you are going through what you need to do to cover that up. So that's the only reason this is not resulted in when that's when he says you are now going to, you're no longer in, in Mimbar and you're here and we're going to convince you that what you believe is wrong. So that's my thought. Okay. Maybe you two can clear up something for me then, because at the beginning of the episode, they, the minister was talking about Veer's report and how they really appreciated his candor and that. Yeah. Uh, but then later on in the episode, Lando asks him, did they like his report? And Veer says, oh, and they especially knew the parts uh, that you uh, had in, uh, made me include. But did Veer change that report? Or did he take Londo's suggestions from the previous episode and incorporate them into this report? I, I think uh, that's... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Lou. Didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think he added part of them, but kept other things. And that's why the minister was saying we could tell which part of those Malari helped you with and which not. And mm -hmm. they were more impressed with Veer's documentation than they were with Londo's fake propaganda. So they were able, and th so when Londo mentioned, he's almost liking, they didn't figure out that I helped you, did they? And Veer very diplomatically, oh, they could tell. So I think that was it. Yeah, they, I thought I yeah. thought it was like, 
they didn't approve of the parts that Londo had put in. And then when he tells Londo, they could tell you help me with it. Londo is proud of that, mm-hmm. but they weren't proud. Of it. Right. You know, so I think it's funny that they're seeing it from two different sides. I think also that Veer has respect for Londo and thinks that Londo might know better what the Centauri would want. And so he included some of his suggestions into the report thinking, well, Londo knows better than me what they want. Yeah. Um, That's just my thought on it. Okay. I'm struggling with this whole storyline between Londo and and Veer because Veer is passive aggressive in his his behavior and actions towards Londo. He really kowtows in his presence but then he goes ahead and does what he thinks is right anyhow and i would but lando is how would you say snobbish or self so self-assured that he doesn't follow up and check on these things if he had seen the report he might have noticed how little or how much of his feedback had been incorporated but i can see from lando's point of view how he could still be affectionate towards Veer because he believes that he can ultimately change him. Yes. But I don't understand how Veer can have any affection or respect for Londo because he can't stand anything that he's done in regards to the Narn. And obviously with his whole Underground Railroad escapade, he's going deliberately against not just Londo, but the normal Centauri culture as well. So I'm trying to work a middle ground, which satisfies what happens in this episode, but I keep getting tripped up on one thing or another. And this is one of the problems. I This is that pragmatic part of me where I can't just let inconsistent behavior go just for the sake of the story, which is one of the big reasons I have with uh, Doctor Who or issues I have with Doctor Who. But this this thing is not. What is the inaccurate? What is the what do you feel is the inaccurate? What do you think? Is I, I just, I, again, it's not one specific thing. It's all these things collectively. Like I'm, I'm saying in this episode, I think he would have been thrown in jail as a war criminal. And I think if Londo believes that Veer is misguided just because is merely misguided for running this underground railroad, then he's, he's really got his head up his own ass more than I thought, to put it bluntly. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that Londo's that stupid. Yeah, And I don't think that Veer is that able to bend over backwards to serve Londo and yet do these things in direct opposition to Londo's point of view. So it's just, it's all just not really hanging together for me. Okay. It's not, I can't say specifically it's one thing, but it's just a collection of all these in, little inconsistencies that are just making it, diff- making it difficult for me to watch their scenes together yeah so to me and this is interesting i hope the listeners find it interesting (laughs) is that i feel like that once again we go to this because they have this relationship and this love londo has covered up what he has done because he's his child but it the is, but the issue yeah. is he, Lando hates the Narn so much. Yes, but he that, loves Veer more. But I don't think that second half of that, that statement has been established. And I think his hate for the Narn is greater than his love for Lon or Veer. Okay. You, you see what I mean? Uh, yeah, it, see, it, and I do feel the, like that's the dynamic that I struggle with. Yeah, I do feel that because he kept him from being replaced when it was going to go to Babylon 5. He told them that no, I can't do my job on Babylon 5 without Veer. When things were going into the dark, he got Veer a job in Mimbari to help them. In this episode, he looks so thrilled that Veer is going to get married. I We've established, you know, as far as Londa has no children, so Veer is as close to a son as he can have. And so therefore, he's going to do everything he can to protect him. That's in my mind. They've done it enough. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm playing with the idea that because Londo knows that uh, they had that prophecy 
that the, both of them could end up on the throne. He's operating under the principle that to keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. And mm -hmm. fear is an interesting friend enemy. Yeah. They both are uh, with each other in a friend enemy. So I could yeah. see. Friend from me. That, you got to say friend of me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I could see from that perspective why they both want to stick around each other. Yeah. But again, and I guess I'm overly, I think they love each other. And they're just, it's well, kind of like. The problem is, like, if you just apply to real world circumstances, yeah. how many families have friends of one have broken up over politics in the last five or 10 years in, in, yeah, in the States? So it's like when I look at that, when I see what's going on in the real world, and then I look at what these guys, if you could apply yeah. these things to real world situations, it's very hard to believe that they still be together like this. Um, and, and I will. And then we'll move on. I'll let you. <laughs> sorry, have the last sorry fans, if no, you're listening no, no. to this and say, "Why are you guys yeah. wasting so much time in this?" No, and we'll but... let we'll let you have the final thought. But I have had. I went to dinner last night and with dear friends and relatives. And Linda kept making the joke. I know you don't want to hug me because you're worried my liberal stink will get on you. And everyone in that house, except for Linda and I and Chris, voted for Trump would vote for Trump again, are absolutely think Joe Biden is incompetent and are convinced that one of them is very convinced that all he wanted out of Trump was to get the judges he wanted because he's so anti-abortion. He doesn't think of it as a woman's choice. And my the other one is so worried that weapons are going to be taken away from him. And I have to just set that aside because I love them. I think That's they're idiots. That's a big ask. Yes, but I do. That's my thought on it, is that because he loves Veer so much, and also he has, by moving Veer, he stopped them from helping other people. So that's another thing Londo would go, okay, that's good. He thinks. But, but yeah, Babylon 5 yeah. is the best place to probably run that kind of operation from. <laughs> and I love the fact, like, over 2,000 Narns, that's a good start. God, mm -hmm. when Londo says that, it's just, you aren't surprised because it's Londo, but it's just horrible to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Karen, so, do you have any so thoughts here, on this? And then I want to give Lou, make sure that we're giving Lou last thoughts. Oh, no, I, you, I, I okay. said my bit, okay. so okay. you, you can move on from this. I'm so sure it, the listeners okay. are tired of this discussion. I think, no, I think this is good because it. we're in three different places where this is concerned. Lou yeah. disbelieves everything, which I can completely see. Yeah. Jesse is romanticizing it completely, yeah. which again... Absolutely. I can see. Yeah. And I'm split in the middle. I do think that Londo has those feelings, but I also think there's part of him that is regretful for what he's done. And I'm reading a whole different thing into this because of that. Mm. Yeah. On the surface, he has to say the rhetoric because that's his deal. Yeah. And I do think there's part of him that it's ingrained. But that he's proud of Veer for doing something that makes such a big mark. He, does that make okay. sense? Yeah. I'm just, I see, I want to see that in, in uh, Londo so much that I'm hope. And uh, again, I think that's why he doesn't turn him in or doesn't make a big deal about what Veer has done because he approves of it. And he also has feelings for Veer, not mm -hmm. love feelings, but he, like a child, like, like a son, exactly. exactly. And I think that overrides his need to report Veer, both things that he's proud of him and that he cares for him more than just a, a valet. But yeah, I, I'm in the middle between you guys. Well, I think it's very nice. Cool. cool. Say is I can be a I can be romantic when I believe that the parties involved are sincere. Oh yeah, we know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's very fair. I meant in this one case. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not over. So let's talk about Veer's intended on the script books. He talked about that Joe Stravinsky <laughs> talked about that he was watching a documentary of and I can't remember the name of it, but basically Southern women in the 50s. 
that were sweet and loving and bless your heart and the racist things they said about <laughs> those other kinds and how they're happier in their own place and we don't need this. And I will not repeat some of these things that are incredibly racist. He said he had that in mind when he was writing her that you could, and he said, and you also, the devil is not ugly. Satan is beautiful, as in Lucifer, right? The mm -hmm. TV show and Neil Gaiman's series. Okay. Yeah. Tom Ellis? Yes. <laughs> I think, and we'll start with you, Karen, on this. I just think this actress played this perfectly. This idea of like, we have arranged marriages. You have a kind face. I'm going to do what my family wants to do. I will end up, you will end up loving me. And poor Veer, who's only been to one. Mm -hmm. First base? No, one. No, one. Because mm -hmm. we have six. Uh, is just incredibly <laughs> fun. And then when you get the reveal that she's, oh, I brought him for you. I wanted to do it myself. It's easy after you do it three or four times. And just the shock in Stephen First's face, who we all know from Flounder and mm -hmm. same elsewhere, he can be a wonderfully comedic actor. And to play that shock and repulsion that this person that he's starting to feel for. And I also was thinking I wanted to go the famous line from Some Like It Hot, No One's Perfect. Mm, right? right. Yeah, yeah. So Karen, let's talk about our Miss... Aryan nation of this yeah. <laughs> yeah, Centauri Asian. Yeah. Linda Stee, they telegraphed the fact that she was creepy. Yeah. She's definitely that over the top kind of Susie Homemaker type. And it's pretty believable because people are very conditioned by their parents. Yes. And we see that today. If we're going to liken it to world stuff, we see kids being brought up in terrible mm. conditions and they they learn that behavior and they carry it on when they get yes. to be adults and you could tell especially when she's talking about her father that they were not just conditioning her but they were indoctrinating her in this yes. belief that the narn are lower than the dirt on her shoe yeah uh, and also, you know, that we already know that arranged marriages are a huge part of Centauri culture from other episodes. So this was all conditioned in her as she was raised. She comes on yeah. board. She is super over-the-top, creepy-tastic, like I said, Susie Homemaker yeah. kind of person. And as long as we're talking about my romantic comedy yes. mindset... Arranged slash forced marriages are another genre. Right. And they do, in the books that I read that are like that, they do end up falling in love. And I think that she desperately wants him to fall in love with her. Yeah. And he wants to fall in love with her even after it's revealed what kind of person she is. As yeah. we see from that last scene, he's hoping he can turn her, and she is hoping the same, yeah. in the opposite direction. I thought that was very lovely. Yeah. That she's, yes, we will work on you too. Yeah. And I'm thinking that Veer, he's accepting his fate with her and hoping he can mold her a little bit. That never works, though. No. You can't really change a person's fundamental mindsets. But I do think they fell in love with each other. And I think with her, she wants him to fall in love with her because she is conditioned again to be, and she knows she's going to be in this marriage and she wants it to be right. good, a good marriage. And again, I think she's very naive when it comes to that. Yeah, um, She seems self-assured. But I think she's naive in that she thinks that Veer will become what she wants. Yeah. Again, that's another huge trope. 
that you try and change them and you end up changing yourself. Yeah. But I honestly don't think that it's going to work between them because Veer is very set in his beliefs. And I do believe that Stephen first did a great job acting in this episode. He is very Veer. Every role he's taken has been Veer. Slounder is a little bit like that. Even his role on St. Elsewhere, he was yeah. very sympathetic to his patients. And I think he does a great job in this role, assuming he was the one that the Narn was coming after and throwing himself in the path of yes. this marauding Narn. It, it, it was completely in his character to act the way he did in this episode. And thinking that Linda Stee is beautiful and wanting to be with her, it was very sweet. But I do think he was horrified by her actions as well, and that shows in that scene as well. Absolutely. Lou, thoughts? An interesting character, and when you judge it against today's standards, it makes it even harder, I think. This might have played a bit better 20 years ago, I don't know, but especially in today's age, it it was hard to watch a character, but you understood the construct of the society that arranged marriages are a thing and blah, blah, blah. I did the the Trojan horsing of the, her attitude towards Naren. She's June Cleaver with an actual Cleaver. So that was an interesting play on that trope. So I did appreciate that. And I thought, again, I thought the actor that played the part, I thought she did a fantastic job. And, at the same time, <laughs> it kind of but it points out the basic relationships between men and women. Men will put up with a lot with women if they think they are beautiful. And yes. I think that plays into this as well. And that's a comment on the sexes in general, I think. that Yeah, so it was interesting, to say the least. But the yeah. reveal of her attitude yeah. about towards Narn was something you've seen done in other situations but i did appreciate that yeah i do like her talking about curring you have to cur the call the herd and the village burning and it was almost like these flowers and and she's there and them as weeds not flowers yeah and and she's just there i do think that any thoughts on we touched on this a little bit Veer going to Susan for advice because they're there and her like, I am the wrong person to talk about this. And you've only gotten to first base. No one. And Mm -hmm. and just doing that. Any, any thoughts, Lou, or you, Karen? Why Karen? Oh yeah. Just poor Susan. Um, I think it's funny that at the end of the episode, she's talking about now that the station has, what do you call it? Her transition broken from yeah. earth mm-hmm. that now she doesn't have as much to do because that part of her job was yeah to interface on behalf of earth so the fact that she's getting called upon to give advice to veer i think is going in the wrong direction for her definitely so i assume that would make her want something to do even more Yes. Uh, I thought it was funny that Veer comes in with that hand gesture of lacing his fingers together. <laughs> and that at the end of that scene, she just subconsciously laces her fingers together and realizes, oh, uh, no, thank you. And she takes her fingers apart. But I, I think it's very telling. We already know that in the last few episodes, even, that she considers herself to not be lucky in love right as it were that she picked the absolute wrong person to fall for and the fact that veer would come to her now and ask her about it when she's at this point where she feels like she can't do anything right there's a pressure on her to not give him advice or to give him the right advice to make up for the fact that she doesn't know what she's doing. Yeah. And I think her ultimate advice to be enthusiastic and and genuine was amazing. That was the perfect advice, especially for him. And um, it, it shows also how she is empathetic, even though she tries to be set apart 
from people. Yeah. She holds herself apart, but she's also very empathetic towards people. And I enjoyed their chat together. It was definitely played for laughs with that little sweetness at the end. And I don't know. I just, I think it's cool. And the fact that we knew what Centauri physiology was. Right. He didn't. Again, that's pretty funny that we were like, oh, we know where this is going. And she's horrified by it. Just a cute scene between the two of them. Yeah. Lou, anything? Yeah, they've done a good job of putting Susan in awkward situations because we know how much <laughs> trouble she has with talking about emotional things and that. I, I did like the play on the, the whole first base yeah. situation. And at the end when Susan says six, six, like that was, yeah, that was funny. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a cute little scene. I thought uh, they, the two of them uh, both played their parts very well. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I also loved watching Veer kissing Lindsay and at first not embracing it and then embracing it. And just you, and Lou, I did want to mention what you said earlier. This is, a, there is a reason why it's a cliche that men will forgive a lot if they are an attractive person person mm -hmm. yep. i i am sure that someone out there go we'll forgive hot men too but it the cliche yes. is more of us guys we'll forgive hot men okay <laughs> good trust me yeah <laughs> or hot women mm -hmm. or just bad boys in general yeah mm, yes <laughs> and so overall we end up with this is they do decide they're going to keep trying to save some narns we had John Sheridan being made to look like a Centaurian, right? And he's, they're going to keep doing this. That's uh, the, the only thing arc-wise I think this is touching. I did notice that why in her dream, everyone in the CNC wasn't in uniform, but they're all in the same, it looked like civilian clothes. We also get Zach kind of in a new uniform. Mm, I you know? like that very much. Yeah. And we got to hear him called Sergeant, right? Yeah. So, so it, yeah. that outfit is like a hybrid, right? Between the Ranger outfit and yeah. the Narn outfit. Yeah. I'm guessing it looked like that to me. Yeah. Good. Anything else we need to talk about? Yeah, there was something. Yeah, the bugs. Yes, the well, bugs. Yeah, the bugs. But... Uh, I wanted to mention, because we were talking about Susan deciding that they were going to continue with the with the Abrahamo Lincoln, Lincoln or whatever. Yeah. Sheridan makes an offhand comment saying, I don't like the jacket. And I think that kind of hits home a little bit because he's just changed his outfit. And again, he's seeing himself in an outfit that he definitely would not want to wear. So... Mm -hmm. I think it has a bigger joke in there than just that offhanded comment that he's talking about. I, look, I just got a new outfit. I don't want to wear something like that yeah. again. Why'd you put me in the Centauri jacket? I just took it as an extension of that. Good. I like mm. that. Okay. Good. And then the bug. Yeah. So thoughts on the bug. I hope there's something in the future about this bug thing because that was the scenes that I liked the, the least in this episode. I just thought it was really weird and a waste of time. I didn't like it wasn't particularly funny. That I didn't find it particularly funny. So I'm curious where these bugs came from and what they grow into. If that's their, if they have different stages. I'm yeah. I'm just curious as to why this was included and hopefully there's a payoff further down the series for the for this whole bug thing all right karen yeah agreed and i do think there's an allegory there about his feelings about the roaches and his feelings about the narns that he just he wants to exterminate them he's frustrated because babylon 5 isn't on his side which again is the same for both yeah. babylon 5 didn't want to come and waste time on it and they're also against him in the war um so well, that's what i thought of. Him, yeah. yeah so i thought uh of that kind of being an allegory for his feelings about the narns but yeah again they you know other than that what did they have to do with anything and him 
trying to kill them, I feel like it's good to see him frustrated by something. And the fact that maybe no one else is complaining about these and he is infested with them, that also says something. Yeah, I just, I think it was an allegory for other stuff and nothing to throw away otherwise. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I didn't care for it much at all. Just not understand what's the purpose. Yeah, I'm right there with you. It might, maybe it was something trying to talk about, as you talked about, Karen, maybe the idea that there's, he's subconsciously or maybe have this. I do think it's going to be interesting if he's afraid of spiders and bugs when he sees a shadow ship, <laughs> which looks right? like, but yeah, I agree with you. Not, not a highlight of the, <laughs> the episode in whatsoever, right? It's just there. Right. So yeah. Yeah. For, for a while, I thought he was just hallucinating them until mm. he, he until got, he's... Got, got it on yeah. the sword. I thought that was yeah. weird. Yeah. Uh, the, the only other thing I, I want to make clear to, to listeners in case there's a thing with thinking, maybe Lou missed this point of the episode. I realize that Londo has covered up what Veer has done. So I, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. And I realize that Veer's bride to be is not aware of the situation either. I just find it very straining of credibility that Londo would cover up such a war crime activity. So that's, yeah, I just uh, want to make that clear. No, I, I, think I understand that. Yeah, I think yeah. that's well said, right? I understood you, it. You understand yeah. what happened. You just don't agree with it. Yeah. Like you don't think it's out of character. Done that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's explicitly stated that at the, the up, up top of the episode when we started talking about it. So I just wanted okay. to make sure I, I raised that point. Very good. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Yes. All right. Anything else? Yeah. We need to visit with? Yes. When Susan gets woken up in her quarters and then the alarm goes off and says it's whatever time it is, EST, it made my ears perk up because I'm in the Eastern time zone, but yeah. it's Earth standard time, I'm assuming, and not Eastern standard time. So I thought it was funny that they would say EST. And so wouldn't they just say GMT then? I well, think it's Earth I think it, Standard Time. I think they're just... But Standard Time on Earth is GMT. It's isn't GMT. It? So I, I think it is Eastern Standard Time. But I don't Do know. you? Yeah. I think it's Earth Standard Time. But the, it doesn't matter. At least yeah. we know that they are sticking to a... 24-hour clock. Right. Exactly. Yeah. A time zone type thing on the ship. Station. Not ship. Yeah, I, I don't, I assumed it was Eastern Standard Time too, but now that oh, you okay. mention it, it does sound like it would be Earth Standard Time, but then you wonder, is everyone now on the Earth one time zone? Impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think they're just highlighting that even though they've cut time ties from Earth, they're still using some of the... I don't know. I could be reading more into it than it no, is. But... I think that's good. All right. Okay. If we don't have anything else, let's rate. I, this was, I, I love it for what it is. A nice change of pace. It gives Stephen First is back now. His other pilot sitcom did not take. So they've got him back full time. And they gave him back and gave him to show, hey, we've missed you, a chance to have a little fun, get a little romance, and show that Veer has a good heart, which we always suspected. And so I, I am glad to have him back. But I'm just going to give it a seven and a half out of ten salt and pepper shakers. Karen. Yeah. I'm going to go a little lower. I'm going to say seven sneaks in residence, Ooh, nice. which is what um, Sheridan gives the title to Susan of sneak in residence. Yes. I like that. All right, Lou. I'm tr trying to keep in the theme of the episode. I'm going to give it six bases plus one for the acting to give it a seven. <laughs> nice i love that that is awesome six bases That's yeah funny. six bases that is so nice six as i cross my fingers yes. yeah plus one great yeah uh, nice. we got a couple of emails did we not karen 
We did. Let me get them. I got to minimize stuff to get to them. Sorry. I understand. No problem. All right. So the first one I'm going to read is Nathan's. He gave us a short email this week. Love this episode. The mystery worked very well to me. And even though Narns in Veer's room on Centauri Prime pointed at your mission, you're mistaken about something regarding him killing them until Lindesty's revelation came. I couldn't find heads from tails in this story. And what an amazing, naive monster she is. Her description of genocide on Narn, though, was confusing to me the first time I watched the show because I thought they all did that during previous occupation, not this one. I couldn't imagine atrocities happening in the present. They were always in the distant past. Veer's tolerance of Lindesty in the end might be too much for some. How can he not be screaming at the Nazi? But I always found it interesting because every culture is okay with most people who kill for it. For example, I don't understand tolerance for your military and politicians when your country wages offensive wars. For me, it's just the same. It's the same just because the set of rules is different and Linda C specifically targeted civilians. It doesn't change much. With regards, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Thank and very you, Nathan. interesting thoughts. Yep. All right. um, and then on to, <laughs> I'm sorry, a Texas Anishok who has a very long email. So I am going to be snipping it. Um, he, they say, or and we thus, always want to remind that we love all of it. Keep them long. It is so much fun to read. And I don't think they will ever join us on the podcast, but I wish they would. Same. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Okay. So I had, I'm sorry. I had to take a drink before I read this. Yes. Texas Animal Shock says, or thus passes the man. And that's sick transit. There's yeah. also a painting by George Frederick Watt entitled sick transit. This is me talking by the way. And I thought the symbolism behind it was interesting. So you might want to look it up. It's at the Tate gallery. Okay. So back to Texas's email. Here's a fun little episode with a few laughs in it. It also marks Steven's first return to the series full time. His other gig didn't last long, so he was able to once again devote his full attention to B5. So, Veer is becoming a man. I'm reminded of Janestown, where the ma magistrate's son overrides the ground lock on Serenity, enabling them to escape. You wanted to make a man out of me, Dad. I guess it worked. Of course, Londo doesn't see it that way and pulls Veer back to Babylon 5. Now we come to Lindesty. What can I say about Lindesty? Lindesty. I find myself strangely fascinated by her, and I keep coming to different conclusions about her. As such, what I'm writing is my current thinking about her. Who knows what it will be by the time you actually get to this. First off, she's played perfectly. Carmen Thomas does a great job. She comes across as very sweet and naive, eager to please. When you watch it again, it comes across as very creepy, and you notice little things like the fact that she never blinks. Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that. Yes, that is creepy. I had read the email before, and I watched a little bit, and it's true. Ooh, very creepy. Um, the creepiest thing to me is when she's going off on that horrible monologue about the Narns. I never got the sense of any hatred or malice from her. It's actually worse than that. Hatred would imply the Narns were worthy of such regard. She simply sees them as animals. She strikes me as a girl who has devoted herself solely to pleasing the men in her life. Whether it's her father or prospective husband, she will devote herself to fully to whatever they desire and has gone out of her way to avoid developing her own thoughts or opinions about anything. So she simply repeats what she's seen her parents do. And here I thought I wouldn't have much to say about this episode. Oh, there's always the next episode, which makes a very satisfying thump. Mm. This is the Texas Endless Shock signing off in Valen's name. So very cool. And I'm going to go back and read through the whole email as soon as we're done. But that's those are some highlights for you guys. And thank yeah. you, Texas. One of the things she said that I'm now 
curious about she says there's a scene in season five that i find myself really wishing she could have been present for jesse probably knows what i'm talking about and i can't think what it is right away i'm going to do a google search to try to find it or texas if you want to send me an email directly you can send it to this email address and i just won't pass it on to lou and karen because they to stay away from spoilers they don't check our email address which is by the way jkl b5 podcast at gmail.com anything on the youtube channel we need to discuss lou yeah there's one really interesting comment from mr dada land is in regards to when garibaldi was rebooting the computer he said there was a deal where the u.s navy had supposedly hacker proofed all their computer systems and proudly proclaimed the fact. The following Sunday was a big Navy celebration. The Air Force cyber, cyberware folk took control of an entire carrier task force and completely shut it down in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Navy brass was going nuts. Finally, an Air Force officer declare, delivered the message, let us know when you want your ships back. Mm. I have never heard of this incident, but that's pretty good. And I have, the Simon has a, a great pun. Let us not forget the Harless and Allison classic. I have no mouth and I want ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's it. Thanks everybody for yeah. your comments. Yeah, absolutely. That was so much fun. Oh, that was episode reading. 11, Ceremonies of Light yeah. and Dark. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. So Lou, if someone wants to comment on our YouTube channel and to find you, how can they? They can, of course, find us on YouTube at Lou's Reviews, where you find this podcast, along with our JKL Media Podcast, where we're currently going through 12 Monkeys. There's also the writer interviews that I do, as, as well as the Stephen King Podcast. And on, is it X now or Twitter? Twitter X? Yeah, it's, yeah. Lou it's Twitter. W <laughs> it's Lou W. Sitzma. I guess the, the way things are going, we might be moving to uh, another social media platform for communications. I don't know, threads or something. We'll have to see. Yeah, uh, I I have not changed to anything yet, and I'm hoping that my group of people that I follow, we can all decide at the same time to switch over. Yeah, I get you. All right. And Karen? Yeah, me and my 2,500 friends on Twitter, yeah. I refuse to call it anything else. I would miss them, definitely, if we went somewhere else. So mm -hmm. I'm sticking with Twitter for the time being. I don't read things en masse. So it's just me and my friends on there. Yeah. So I am at Elevaria on the Twitter machine and on various other platforms as well at Elevaria. He logged in to get all those just in case. And my blog is alliesstuff.com. It's in my bio on, on Twitter. And the landing page has a bunch of links, lots of information for you if you like the kind of stuff we like. All right, I am on the Twitter machine, the X machine at no, Jesse Jackson. No, stop calling it that. <laughs> it's like the when a when the stadium, one of your favorite sporting stadiums, gets changed, where it's no longer the ballpark in Arlington, but it's Globe Life Park. I'm or sorry, something. Candlestick Park will always be Candlestick yeah. Park to me. You can find me on Facebook. Jesse Jackson in Louisville, Texas, and you can hear on this very feed us talking about 12 Monkeys. We are having a blast talking about that series. Go to iTunes, rate and review us. Give us some love. We would. And there are three or four other Babylon 5 podcasts that are all doing the same thing, rewatch. So we appreciate you taking time to listen to us. And so tell a friend about it. Help us grow. That would be very kind of you. I think this will wrap this one up, guys. Next week, we have a very special guest star mm. that actually was in consideration for being the lead on the show. Mm. So I look forward to hearing you guys talk about it and we will discuss. But for now, thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. You're most welcome, sir. Same to you. And thank you, listeners. Stay hydrated. Stay safe. Be kind. And we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. All right. Let's see.